Hello. Hi. Hello. Yo. Uh, well, currently we are streaming. Yes, they can. Hi, chat. Well, maybe we should do an intro for everybody who. Sounds like they can't hear you over the music, Dragna. Oh. Looking at chat right now. Yeah, you're really low. Yeah. Jack, do you want to introduce yourself next? Hi, um, my name is Jack. <laughs> this is After Dark. <laughs> That's his After Dark oh. voice. Yes, my After Dark voice. Uh, this is where you get the good stuff. Uh, no, I am Jack. I play Metreon uh, on Curse of Strahd. Curse of Strahd. Curse of Strahd, twice bitten. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm really pink. So, uh, yeah. I'll go next. next, I guess. I am I am Serena. I am playing Kiva. Um, that's my after dark voice. Uh, there's probably also a fan in the background, so please tell me if it's too loud over my microphone. Um, but yeah, that's I'm blue, da ba dee, da ba da, da ba dee. That's my intro. Hello, uh, I am Linus. I'm playing Amity on Twice Bitten. And um, I guess I'm red. Hello, uh, I am Kaya. I play Lillison on Twice Bitten. Um, I am also going to be gathering questions from stream chat today. So please, uh, for the sake of my sanity, if you have a question to submit, please do it through stream chat and please put the word question in the front so I don't accidentally overlook it. Uh, Lillison seems to have been declared by the community to be like dark brown, uh, but in my mind, she's uh, olive green. So there we go. All right, and how's my audio? I think I might've fixed it. Uh, we'll give the chat a second to go through, but I think I've set it up properly. Uh, in the meantime, um, let's just give it a second to let that percolate. Okay, excellent. Looks like people can hear us. Sounds like it's me. fixed. Beautiful. All right, hello everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties. We are missing our beautiful producer, Jeplukas tonight. Uh, he is asleep after a far too long mod meeting. Uh, so. Uh, he is getting some well-deserved Z's while we enjoy uh, tonight's stream. Uh, and given the concentration of memes we're about to have tonight, he probably would not approve, so it's probably all for the best. Uh, so with that, uh, let's jump into the first uh, discussion. We're going to do a little bit of a zigzag between twice bit in discussion and some, you know, Curse of Strahd analysis. Uh, all of us here, as mentioned, are Curse of Strahd DMs. We've run the module, we've analyzed it and discussed it. So we're not going to feel restricted to just talking about twice bit. And so this is a bit more of a spoiler heavy, uh, I guess, discourse or conversation. Um, so we're going to do some flip flops back and forth, uh, tossing some questions around. But for now, let's start with some uh, basics. Uh, given the first episode that just happened, and again, a big thank you to everyone who watched it. We love you guys and we incredibly appreciate you, especially all the reactions we saw in the chat. Um, going to the cast though, what were your favorite moments from the first uh, session? Um, 
anything having to do with truffle? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that's the that's the the first the, the that's the first one that comes to my mind. Um, but honestly, uh, uh, in all seriousness, not that that wasn't serious. Uh, just like the just getting it started in the campfire stories, and like I feel like that was a nice little sneak peek into who everybody's going to be or who everyone is now and all that. Oh, and this is actually a two-part question. Uh, is there also a most unexpected moment from the episode? Uh, truffle. <laughs> just Minus all the truffle. Every, every answer is <laughs> I, Well, I mean, I might, just, I might just do that in, uh, in my Bajoka voice. But seriously, I did not expect someone to, knowing what this, this campaign is, to go, you know what, let me bring in a cute pig. Uh, because... Yeah, that's a bold choice. Exactly. Um, I think one of my favorite moments, I guess not for the moment specifically, but for what it foretells, was Ethan Deer suggesting some uh, complex plan involving tying a wire around the suit of armor and like having people bait it from the other side. I guess just because I'm looking forward to these kinds of plans actually being used in the future. Yeah, that should be fun. Um, honestly, you don't see a lot of creative plants happening a lot in D&D, so I'm intrigued to see what kind of insanity you people come up with. Kaya, Serena, anything from you guys? Yeah, I think for me, um, obviously Truffle is a highlight in all of our lives. Um, <clears throat> but I had two things that I really was sort of favorite and unexpected. My favorite was probably Jack's, um, accent slip to the more, like, rough and tumble, um, less refined when he first, when Metreon first started panicking and was just like, I'm fucking out of here. So good and such a neat little character choice. Um, and then the most unexpected moment for me was the animated armor being on the third floor <laughs> because um, I read Death House a long time ago and forgot that it was there. So I had Kiva just being like, all right, time to go find this fucking nursery. And uh, uh, yeah, got bitch slapped by some anime. I'm cursing a lot. I don't know if that's allowed. It's no, that's dark. fine. It's after dark. Um, Go for it. It's after dark. The, the animated armor was the most unexpected for me. Um, yeah. Wow. What a, what a surprise. That was fun. That was great. I, I actually, like, when you said, like, oh, I forget entirely about Death House, I was like, oh, yes. Here's my chance. Yeah, I mean, for, for you, it's you're literally running it for someone who's never done it before for me. So it's everything in Death House is going to be. Um, there are some things that I remember, um, and I'm not going to tell anyone what those are. Um, but there are, most of it, I'm like, I don't know where anything is or what anything is or what the traps are. So I'm literally flying by the seat of my pants here. Beautiful. Literally. Cool. Well, uh, Kaya, what about Kaya, you? Kaya. What are your, what is your, yeah. Um, I gotta say that I hadn't been paying a lot of attention to all of the, uh, class speculation beforehand. And so every single time somebody revealed what class they were, that was a great unexpected moment. Um, I know the community is still going back and forth on like how much each of this proves, but you know, Kiva deciding she would like to rage, uh, that was iconic. Um, Amity busting out the vicious mockery, uh, that was super great. Um, but I would like to say my favorite moment, and I know this is uh, a bit smug of me, but my favorite moment was um, Lillison like, just running past that animated armor because everybody thought she was going to die. Like I've been listening for over a month to everybody saying like she's going to die right away. And I've been privately saying, like, She's got the highest AC and uh, she's got the shield spell. I do not think she's actually going to die. And it felt great to uh, actually put that out there. She is by far the most likely the one to get out of death house, honestly. I, I don't think I've said it before and I'll say it again. I don't think she's going to die. I think she's going to get us killed. <laughs> I mean, that's uh, for me to know and you to find out. I will, you know, uh, I, I assume everyone you who's actually... watching has watched, but... Uh... Uh, the whole like, I don't know. The you just kind of jumping in the battle uh, was 
very interesting. Not def- that def- is definitely like a character trait I was not expecting. So that's another thing that I was very surprised by. Twy, what about you? What was your favorite and most unexpected moment since you just joined us from the? <laughs> uh, two separate ones, probably. Also, am I coming through all right? Yeah. Good yeah, shit. I can hear you loud and clear. Good shit. So, favorite moment? I'm. Hmm. Honestly, the campfire stories, no contest. Like, that was just such a natural, lovely scene. And, like, it kind of said so much about all of our characters and was such a, like, neat kind of character-building thing without being obviously a character-building thing. Like, it was content. It, It just was... And just... I really liked how, like, the form everyone's stories took really reflected on their characters. Amity did something short, did something short, but meaningful with a moral and with some, you know, her fairy tale, her fairy tale flair. Jack, or blah, sorry, give me a second. Uh, Lillison did something that was meaningful, really fucking dark and metaphorical as all fuck. Hmm. Uh, Metreon did something that was... Fairly extravagant, very, uh, it, 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 it felt like it was coming out of his mouth. Like it, that it kind of, the story flowed the same way he talked. And then Kiva with the same thing. It just like the form everything took very much reflected what, the characters were like and that is my favorite fucking thing to see in media just like y'all did such a good job holy shit i mean i will happily second that happily that was really great yeah ah as well as moment that surprised me the most hmm i uh <laughs> honestly like how much trouble we ended up having with the animated armor Like, I guess I've gotten so used to, like, optimized PCs and high-level D&D that I forgot that, like, fuck, this game can be really hard. Like, like, it's kind of being on the other side of that. It's like, what do you mean I have to burn through this many hit points? That's really hard. What do you mean it can kill me in one round? What? Especially the level one characters that are just, like, you know, they're wet tissue paper, basically. Exactly. It's just like, how do you expect me to hit this? 18? Do you know what my mod is? So that kind of... Go ahead. Level 1 characters that uh, haven't yet figured out that disengage is necessary. Yeah. Oh yeah, 100%. 100%. Yep. <laughs> and haven't figured out that psychic and poison damage doesn't work terribly well in constructs. No offense. I would just yeah. like to say that yep. Metreon has figured out from day one that disengage is an important and vital thing. <laughs> <laughs> The vital <laughs> yeah, no, that was that was also a favorite moment. Like, just wonderfully done. Uh, but yeah, no, that's me. Running away is an important extracurricular in D and D's public schools. Yes. Yeah, and I do think it's something that you know, part of the reason why I didn't run it was because I was like, how am I going to get a level one party? I'll kill them instantly, and I did not feel confident in my own DMing abilities to be like to get a party through it. Um, and I don't feel confident in keeping to get dirty in there, so it's going to be a lot of fun. I've got to say, it was pretty fortuitous that the first person to get into combat was the one person who could have all of the damage coming her way. So, kudos. Oh. Dragna, you've got, you're going a little robot Oh, dear. Yeah. I think I'm... I, yeah. Oh. Someone in chat pointing out that, like, I love the experience party of a bunch of DMs immediately split as soon as they got into Death House, which I also think is just brilliant. And we we're I all like, all right, you guys too. wait outside and we'll go in. It'll be like two five minutes. minutes. It'll five be minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> it's like, it's not as if we didn't know what was going to happen if we didn't go. Yeah. It's like... Also, Linus being like, what is this, some kind of murder house? Brilliant. Wow. Did I say that? Wow. When, when yeah. Was- you yeah. did. You did. You did. And word it was for word. So good. It was so good. What are we? Some sort of curse? Oh. No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really do like that. That like uh, Amity, especially because she's got the kind of moxie for it, is like the meta voice of the game in a lot yes, of ways. Definitely. At least the one game My that we played. 
but oh I, god I, like I i didn't know i was being surprised ah. So we're putting that um, pressure on you for the rest of session to keep that up consistently. Right. So good luck. No. Oh, 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 absolutely. Everything you saw from us in session one, that's going to be completely, completely consistent accurate. with our computer. Yeah, yeah, Nothing no, nothing's day. changing. There's nothing new that's going to be revealed, I think, at any point. <laughs> no, I, I think we revealed everything about our characters. Yeah, uh, we, we don't need to reveal anything else. Yep, right, Ari, Ari yeah, will, no. will subsist on one cantrip for the rest of his life, and it will be great. <laughs> you know, cantrips Speaking go up, so that's fine. They do! It'll be fun. Speaking of reveals, uh, our next bullet point is talking about Serena's class choice, because that is the one class that has been confirmed. Um, will you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so, uh, as anyone who knows from sort of talking to me in the server, um, Barbarian is my absolute favorite class. If I could play one class for the rest of my life, it would just be Barbarian's. Um, and I really wanted to sort of examine, um, my relationship with the Barbarian as a class, but also the relationship of, um, a Barbarian, like, how do you function with that rage inside of you? How do you, how do you deal with that? Um, and for someone who has a hell of a lot of drama and, um, and sort of issues to work with looking at rage as an outlet of like fight or flight response or PTSD. Um, and so what happens when the rage really is something that you can't control? Um, I'm not going to give any spoilers for, for backstory purposes, you know, the stuff that will be re revealed later on, but um, I spent a lot of time with Kiva and, and looking at her relationship with rage and um, bouncing ideas off of Dragna, who was just so helpful in the character creation process um, to make sure that I was doing it, um, you know, correctly and, and not um, potentially offensively, but also um, sort of subverting class tropes. Like Kiva is not a 17 strength, you know, muscly bound woman. She's an average elf woman who's much more dexterous than she is strong. Um, and, you know, how does that rage sort of affect her life in a um, negative and, and hopefully in the future positive way is going to be something interesting to explore. One thing that I uh, kind of just uh, tailing off of that, um, because you had mentioned not being like a super strong, like physically strong stat wise uh, barbarian. I think it's really interesting to see. Uh, it's, it's really interesting to see people when they pick a class due to narrative reasons and not just for statistical mechanical reasons um so it isn't that you aren't an effective barbarian it's just like you're not optimizing in a way that is expected and i always appreciate that in players when they do that yeah i i and there's nothing i want to preface this by saying there's absolutely nothing wrong with min maxers at all and people who optimize their characters it's a totally valid way of playing the game for me i I don't, I feel like I'm not smart enough to understand the like stat balancing required. <laughs> um, so for me, I'm like, what is the most narratively interesting character? And someone who like is a barbarian, but absolutely hates this thing that her body does um, is just something that's so interesting to me that like the last thing she wants to do ever is rage. And that's the biggest feature of a barbarian. So like, how do, how do you deal with that? Um, is something that I just fucking, I love. I love it. So there's a corollary to that, I think. Which is that we have two other characters who we don't know much about at all, who have barely done anything or made any attacks or cast any spells. I think we have no. two of them in the chat right now. Who would those be? <laughs> well, aren't you playing coy? I'm, I'm curious. What's what's uh what are what are the others' guesses? What are what are Kaya, Serena, and Twice guesses about what Amity and uh, Metrion are? Oh man, I Amity. I thought I had figured out. I was like, all right, you know, rogue warlock, totally fine. Like, got it. Metrion, I was a little more confused about. Now I'm completely in the dark about both of them. <laughs> Again, I'm not someone who really understands like the intricacy of stats. Um, so 
people who were guessing based on like hit points and like stats, that's all fascinating to me and more power to you. Um, but I don't know. Now I'm thinking like Metreon might be a bard, but also not. Like I was thinking like Metreon could be a fighter that's just like pretending to be a bard or a wizard, you know, and just like some scrappy guy who's like, yeah, like Strawberry is saying, like just being some like con man. Um, and Amity, I oh, just the most fascinating. I have to say, I love everyone's characters, but Amity in particular is an enigma that I just want to spend the rest of my life getting to the bottom of. I'm going to say, um, I think Amity is a bard. Uh, at first, when all we had to go off of was the art, I actually thought Amity might be a paladin, but evidently not. And um, I think I have Metreon pinned pretty well. I think Metreon is um, a rogue, uh, either with the charlatan or the noble background. Well, that's a hot take. Yeah. Hmm. I'm honestly torn, because, like, Amity, I feel like what's been revealed of her character skews towards Bard. Like, kind of the, you know, the book of fairy tales, the writing, like, that whole thing kind of lends itself to being kind of, you know, sort of talking about the power of stories and how we relate to them. That, like, that seems like it'd be really cool. But also, like, she could also just be a kick-ass wizard. Like, there's... So those are my guesses going forward. And Metreon, I'm honestly torn on. Like, putting stats aside again, I think he reads, like, his actions and kind of how he talks as either a rogue or, I guess, a... Not, not warlock, like, maybe sorcerer or something. Someone who is competent, but doesn't really want people to know such. And I actually realized I left out one person who's also been an enigma. Uh, what do you all think Erthrandir is? Well, um, so I do have a theory. I won't go too deep into it because I want other people to kind of un uh, unpack what my theory is and what it is about. But I suspect that Erthrandir is an artificer. That's a very hot take. Care to back that up? No. I'll, all right. <laughs> so I'll take it. Here, deal with it. I love the intrigue. I love it. I love it. Top tier. I I have Metreon pinned down, and this is a bit of a wild guess, but I'm going with it, as a monk, but who's going to be very roguish in a monk way. Like, you know, self-proficiency. I like that. Tools. Oh, Oh my god, he would be such a cool drunken master monk. Holy shit. Oh, oh yeah. Oh my god. He yeah. says as if he's just discovering that now. I am! You could be playing us on multiple levels. We don't know that. Look, I'm, uh, I'm good, but I'm not that good. The players from uh, my Curse of Strahd campaign think that Metreon is uh, a rogue who's planning to go um, arcane trickster. Oh. I'm sort of obsessed with Drunken Master Metreon right now, though. Like, I think I'm a big, I'm a big fan of that. I also think Rogue would be appropriate for him. As Although... for Airy, and I'm sorry, chat, I already got permission from Twy to say that. Um, I have no idea. What the fuck he is. <laughs> I was like, Ranger? Okay, got it. Nope, not Ranger, because he said Ranger, so he wouldn't be that obvious. And then I was like, Wizard makes sense because he's studious and he's got glasses and, you know, glasses or whatever. Um, I, I have no idea. And again, I don't know enough about spells to be like, oh, because based on your spell list, I can figure this out. So I am completely in the dark about everyone. <laughs> I, I heard him say that he liked cities better than forests. So I was like, oh, he's a ranger who's favored like terrain as city. But then I checked and that's not one of the favored terrains. So it I give be. up. Yeah, wasn't there an urban Yeah, terrain? no. Hmm. I mean, I don't, was it Ernest Arcana maybe? Or have they actually come out with one? Hmm. I have no idea. I've, I haven't seen anything. Hmm. Then again, I'm the guy who got Xanathars for... Uh, a present and literally just skip past the entire player section. So I'm <laughs> I, just want to, ask. 
I just want yeah, those that does sound about right. I just want those night, those knot tying rules, man. Very important. Don't we all? All right, so I'm kind of curious now, kind of to tie it into the broader Curse of Strahd, uh, you know, and D and D situation. We've got, you know, kind of an interesting and in some ways standard, in some ways not standard character introduction. How do you all tend to run your own, you know, PC, you know, introductions slash meet and greets? And uh, what's your experience been like while running them for Curse of Strahd? Um, Well, so my, uh, I preface this by saying my Curse of Strahd is very different. But um, so uh, if I may go on a bit of yarn. Uh, I've been running with my group of three years, and the regular game that we all kind of met under uh, was a game I'm, I am still currently running, um, but it's very, very intense and dark. Um, it's very edgy. Uh, so I distinctly wanted to play with the module in a more heroic, pulpy kind of way, uh, which is why I went with the whole 1980s thing. Uh, but that's a different thing. Um, but as far as character creation, what I did for the other game was n- n- everyone was supposed to do everything in secret. So no one knew their class, no one knew their race, no one knew anything about that. Um, so very kind of similar to what we did with uh, Twice Bitten. Um, but I wanted to ease up on that a bit because I wanted some plugged in relationships. Uh, so I let the players know their class, just their class. They didn't know subclass. Um, and since everyone is a human in my party, uh, and that was designated by me, um, they would know that they were all human, but they were allowed to pick racial stats, which I didn't re- let them reveal uh, because I wanted one of those to kind of come out organically. Um, but otherwise, yeah, like everyone knew each other. Um, there were some built in relationships that I let people kind of pair off and, you know, um, and do their thing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically it. Yeah, for mine is a bit unconventional because I did not expect my game to really start in the sense that I kind of ran Death House as a one shot and then things snowballed as they are wont to do with people who are having a fun time together. But my philosophy on it was essentially throw them into the thick of it immediately and let them bond through that. Like, they, the session started with them waking up in Barovia, the mist took them last night, 30 second explanation of how they'd been traveling in a caravan together, go. And it could have gone terribly, but it didn't. Because they were starting out in kind of an adventuring party mold, and then, and then Death House happened. And suddenly they kind of became an actual, like, party and not just a group of you who's are staying together for mutual protection and i won't like go on about that too much but i do think that's definitely one of early Strahd's strengths is its ability to bring parties together a lot more effectively and cohesively than a lot of modules because there are really few bonds like terror Yeah, that's definitely fair. I mean, for me, Curse of Strahd is all about... I mean, you can run it in a few ways. You can run it either in... Uh, I think we were actually just discussing this in the Curse of Strahd subreddit the other day, or Discord the other day, which is that you can either run it as, you know, Barovia is a place where you're going to, you know, accomplish something of a personal nature. Maybe you're a native Barovian. Maybe you're, you know, it was your ancestral homeland or you're related to a Vistani or Strahd in some way. Um... I guess a section option, second option would be like you're going there for kind of character fulfillment. That's like the usual Madame Ava approach, right? Where like you get invited to Barovia and you know, you, you're going there to achieve some sort of personal quest that might not be related to you directly, but that will, you know, achieve something that you would like to, you know, make possible. And then the third option is just, you know, you get thrown in there and, you know, you may or may not know each other, but you are now expected to survive and possibly escape. And in the meantime, you've got this vampire that's just hunting you down and just getting in your face and everything is terrible at all times and like you said that is a really powerful potential bonding experience um for a new party because where are you gonna go there's no escape everyone else is terrible and most of them have no souls so guess you're gonna stick with the people you came in with even if they're a bit of a bum Yeah, I can definitely. Yeah, I think 
Oh, go, go ahead, Twy. Nah, nah, I'm done. <laughs> um, I feel bad I'm talking so much. Um, I think it's really interesting how we did this character creation, because normally I like to try in my campaigns to sort of have at least two characters, like, either pair off and know each other. It's the Matt Mercer, like, method of, like, AB characters and stuff. Um, but this was really cool going into it <clears throat> completely blind. Um, in the campaign that I was running, I also ended up doing it that way. None of the PCs wanted to have linked backstories. Um, so, you know, the Creeping Fog modified hook that I used um, sort of brought these people together at the same place pretty randomly. Um, and I tied them together through the act of getting the Taraka reading. Um, so it was it was really interesting. Dynamics are very different when the PCs at least have one or two people that they're familiar with versus not knowing each other. And if y'all don't mind, we were sort of talking earlier today about like friction in the party and, and that sort of feeling. And I think for me, it's a lot more like spicy and delicious if the PCs don't know each other um, because it leads for those really natural moments of like potential friction or, you know, bonding in weird ways that you wouldn't normally get if everyone knows each other and if that makes any sense no it really does i think especially because you know you get all the juicy stuff of you know soap opera of soap opera drama but you also get that you know paranoia of like a mystery or a slasher film where like you don't know these people you don't trust these people you don't know where they're coming from and like you know in a usual D D party you know, where the PCs are less characters than, you know, vehicles for the players to experience the story. Obviously, that's that falls a little short and that is not really the maybe the most relevant way to look at character interactions. But in a story where the players are, you know, immersing themselves in the character's skins and, you know, uh, Serena might know out of character that, you know, Aerith Deer is, you know, a chill guy, but or at least that Twy is, but in character, Kiva does not know that Erythrandir is not actually just Strahd in a skin suit, or I guess, uh, uh, Bajilka in a skin suit, so. Well, we do know. <laughs> do we you do now, know? spoiler alert. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I should have marked that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like, for, for my party, for example, um, none of them knew each other before the actual campaign started, or none of the PCs, that is, in character knew each other. But like, out of character, they were totally talking about their characters to each other and being like, oh man, I have a lawful good cleric, and so they're going to be so annoyed at your rogue, we can have all these uh, cool character interactions. So I definitely didn't go the direction Dragon did, where none of us know anything about each other. But um, uh, I guess it's a, it's a little bit more theatrical, maybe? Uh, if a bit more pre-planned sometimes. And what kind of uh, outcome do you think you've come from that? Because I know you've gotten pretty far on your campaign and you've had some pretty juicy drama. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I do really like uh, the, the juicy drama that's come up. Um, I think that it's not totally necessary to do what I did where, where players like talk about character interactions ahead of time because I mean the juicy drama can just come up later after people know enough about their characters to, to orchestrate that. Um, and one of my players does have secrets in their backstory to the extent that I read a 51 page backstory fanfic they sent me earlier today. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I feel like I was rambling. What, what was the question? Uh, I guess it was mostly <laughs> just like, you know, how you feel, you know, what you started with in terms of your party uh, composition and your party and your character introductions, like what kind of impact that had on the later campaign. And I think you kind of touched upon a lot of it. Sure, yeah. And I, I'm sure you put in some work behind the scenes, Dragon, to make sure we didn't all play like broody, edgy uh, wizards who would like sit far away from the rest of the party and not engage. I, I actually did not. I mean, I didn't, I, I didn't nudge anyone to do anything other than what I put in the original uh, Session Zero, you know, rundown list. I just said, you know, make a character by these specifications and whatever else you want to do, you're free to do so. Like, I actually was really grateful that we got such a diverse assortment of, of characters, you know, like, this was really, really cool to see everyone coming out and, you know, fitting together. So I have a quick question um, for, every, for the rest of the, the cast. How did you all come up with just the one 
or did you have multiple? And you don't have to go into detail about your alternative uh, alternates if you have them, but I'm just curious to see how many people came up with like different ideas. Just the one. Uh, yeah. Like four? I don't know. Dragon can say that he um, like rejected a few ideas that I originally had because they weren't like totally in line with his vision. I, I that's fair, but I will kind of preface that by saying it was more of it, it was it was more like you know referring to the original session zero list it was kind of like hashing out what the campaign was about and what the pcs were supposed to be like less you know the bro the broody loner bit but yeah i'd forgotten about that that was uh i still feel bad for like spiking a bunch of those uh pitches no it was, I, like, I, was I, like everyone else was like working on like you know intense backstory lore and you're like hi dragna i've got another character idea and i'm like hey linus it's 4 p.m time for your character flattening <laughs> that sounds like a long-standing appointment. Where can I get one of those? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Let's get my clarity flat. Um, it was that I I looked at the prompt for like making your character, which had you know a bunch of detail, and I sort of like got the wrong idea about it in a few places. Um, I guess I can't be too specific unless Dragna lets me be. If you want to talk uh, about your other no, ideas, it, you're free it, it to do anything, so. You know. <laughs> Um, like there were some of that were really fantastic. It's just like I was like, oh, the vibe though. I don't think I want to bring up other ideas just because it will maybe give too much information about my current idea to say what was rejected. Yeah, yeah, I feel you there. I had think. an alternate. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Jesus Christ, I keep interrupting people. It's okay. Um, I will say just very quickly um, when I ran uh, Curse of Strahd and Death House, I actually had one of my um pcs already in death house uh like looting the place everybody else went through the mist hook and uh, fought some wolves and got sort of like driven by the wolves into the house where they you know when they were um exploring the dining room uh literally stumbled across the fourth party member and i think that that was a pretty tense uh first meeting um definitely stirred up some friction um you know, in, in character, juicy developments, but that's not the sort of thing that you can really do unless you have a player that you already trust extensively to make this work with you. So something that's come up a little bit uh, is, you know, discussions of expectations and character building. What do you guys think are the most important, you know, expectations to set with your players before you even sit down for the first session? I mean, I guess either in a session zero checklist or just, you know, items you want to talk about uh, in private message or wherever before you actually sit down and start rolling dice. So do you, I... Oh. Do you mean, like, expectations about what their character should look like or what their behavior should be? Like? I would say character, uh, behavior, uh, even campaign expectations, uh, specific things about content. What do you think is most important that the players understand before they start playing Curse of Strahd? So what I usually do, and what I did for uh, Barovia was I made, I just made out like a, like a kind of a pre-production doc, if you will. Um, and it had not only like references to the kind of campaign I wanted to run, um, whether it was movies or music or film or whatever. Um, but there's also, I always do like an extensive questionnaire to um, get, an, get a sense of who they want to play. And in those questions, I try to create um, try to create a sense of getting like I try to try to encourage my players to create answers that would fit with the references I also provide in the rest of this kind of like uh, mood board this production doc thing that I make um, so all I say all of that to say that when you're at least my advice when you are creating something you have to have the vision in your head of what you want it to be and you can set your players up for success if you are willing to kind of deep dive with them. And I find that it's best to kind of front load that process with uh, getting into their mind, uh, into both the player's mind and the player character's mind uh, as quickly as possible um, so that you're able to kind of like figure out whether or not it's going to work or whether or not you might not need to change something or whether it's just not going to work at all. I think uh, just piggybacking off of that, it's really important to do with Curse of Strahd, in my opinion, um, that sort of questionnaire, um, session zero, because 
I was running it with a group of friends that um, I was very close with and I am very close with. I understand all of their boundaries, but Curse of Strahd in particular has some very, very niche stuff that can really um, get to people in a lot of ways that I don't think they're expecting. And so I did also sort of a pre-production thing where I was like, this is sort of the vibe that I want to give. Um, this is how I, how I want the things to feel and how I would like things to feel. And I encourage you to help me tell the story in this way. Um, I can all, like very briefly speaking about um, following Dragna's guide, um, which was like my Bible for running my campaign. I had an Irina PC. Um, so that was also a really important conversation to have pre-session um, because, you know, holy God, working out that relationship as a DM with a player and being like, all right, let's make sure we're doing this respectfully and we're not crossing each other's boundaries and um, and how do we tell this story um, effectively without having to necessarily go into the stuff that um, makes both of us a little uncomfortable. <laughs> um, but yeah, I definitely recommend like a pre-production checklist. I think Jack's got it right on. Like, don't be afraid to tell your players this is the sort of vibe that I'm going for because we're all telling a story as DMs and players together. Um, so as much as we set the scene, the players can also shape the world that we want with their characters and with their choices. Very cool. Um, and yeah, I think one thing that my players uh, always ask me uh, with a new adventure is what kind of quest hook is there going to be? Uh, because they want to cooperate with me and make a character who will like respond well to those hooks. And so for Curse of Strahd, I, I outright just told them like, you're going to be stuck somewhere. Uh, so, you know, characters in your backstory will probably not show up. Uh, there's going to be a lot of quest hooks of the form like, this good person is in trouble, please help them. Um, I guess one thing that I did strangely is that uh, I didn't run like a introduction going through the mists for the entire party together. I did sort of an individual session 0 0.5 for each player where I just took their character into Barovia. That's actually really uh, I've never really cool. seen that before. Um, I, I want to say that it was a very artistic intentional choice, but it was sort of forced on me because one of the characters had just come from the Death House campaign that I had run a year ago. Uh, one of them had their backstory as growing up in Barovia, and one of them had their backstory as I'm just now coming in through these mists. And so I, I felt sort of uh, forced to do it, but I think it did work out really well. Yeah, no, that's a really goddamn cool idea. I'm going to try that that next time, and there will be a next time. Well, God help us when there is, but that's really goddamn cool. I think for mine, kind of two things, one small and one big. The big one is, I think for Strahd, one thing that isn't obvious and that is you really need to think about and communicate to your players before you start, or at least kind of as you start, is that it is kind of uniquely oppositional in the sense of it is pretty much the only, one of the only D&D &D modules I, I can think of where the main villain is an active reactive force to what's happening to the point that where you're not safe you are never safe if you get strawed to the right emotional state he can swoop down and murder your ass this is a thing that can happen and part of that is what gives the adventure this delicious tension what makes it like what keeps the horror atmosphere going as long as it does but it also needs to be managed pretty carefully, because if you're not expecting that, that can really suck, especially if you're going out of the gate and people are itching for a fight. I have uh, i didn't have it happen myself, but I've seen more than one campaign end to Strahd at level 5, because people got mad that he called them mean names, and then they died. It was sad. And as for a small one, Talk to everyone individually about how they feel about, I guess the like community thing would be dark powers, but sort of individualized side quests, power boosts, whatever, and get a gauge on what kind of people would be into that and whether that w they'd be at all interested in the possibility of corruption down the line. Because this is 
That's probably my biggest regret from Curse of Strahd was horribly misreading a player and thinking that he was way, way more into a corruption plotline than we were developing than he was. And yeah, that that's like six months of work I'd quite like to get back. Ouch. Linus, I, know that feel. I believe you you played for Dragna before, correct? Correct. So what like I'm really curious about you know, obviously I'm familiar with Dragna enough from the server, but like, what was that like the first, the first campaign? Is it, does it feel different this time? Like what's, what's the, give us the old Dragna lore. <laughs> uh, give us well, that piping hot tea. So first of all, you're asking me to compare these two cam campaigns after a single episode of the newest one. So it's going to be yep. a, a little yep. tricky. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> so the, this twice bitten is obviously way more character focused, um, uh, along with this uh, neat idea of like n not revealing anything about our PCs to each other uh, beforehand. Um, hmm. I feel like overall the style is 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 quite similar though. Uh, hmm. What what exactly? I see. I, the thing is that I don't want to give his tricks away too much if you haven't seen them yet. <laughs> I feel, so I feel I flattered. I be very careful I about now. what to say here. Um, but I don't know, the old campaign was also pretty nice and, and character-y. I feel that way at least. Oh yeah, we had some really good spins, especially toward the end. Um, I'm not going to get too spoiler, but we had a... And like, like it was... It was in some ways a more traditional D&D &D campaign. It was a bunch of friends that were, you know, having a good time and uh, exploring Barovia together, but... Um, like, there were some fun character arcs um, between the character that Linus played, uh, if you want to talk briefly about her, as well as one of the other ones. Oh, uh, right, yeah, I played a, um, a rogue who was uh, quite spirited, also quite... Um, my, my character in that campaign was quite racist against the Vistani, uh, only in character, though, just because certain things came up uh, in that game. Um, and I think towards the end of that campaign, uh, had a uh, insecurity about not really holding to a consistent set of morals and sort of wanting to go out on kind of like, I, I want to say vision quest, so that's not really accurate. Just Just trying to like okay, from here on out, I'm going to figure out what the right thing is and, like, stick to it. Um, and, like, sort of lean on the, the monk in the party as, as for what that actually is. Yes, the, the uh, monk actually had the best punny name, which I didn't realize until halfway through the campaign. Oh, yeah, what it was so it? good. Uh, just because I didn't hear from Kaya, what was, Kaya, what was your uh, Curse of Strahd process like setting up the game? Well, um, my process was originally, I was like, oh, hey, as a first time DM, maybe it would be nice if I bought this module on World 20 where everything is set up for me. I will not have to do any prep. <laughs> Love <laughs> <lazy>. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, basically what I did was um, in the month leading up to the beginning of the campaign, I came across uh, Mandy Mod's guide and I just devoured that instead of actually working uh, at the office. Um, and then I took pretty much um, the vague beginnings of character um, backstory and plot hooks that my players had handed me. And I discovered that I could hook them um, into Barovia and braid them around each other and ended up creating like this secondary antagonist, um, Rahadin's mother. Um, and, you know, the, the progenitor of the Heart of Sorrow that everybody was way more interested and invested in destroying than they were in destroying Strahd. So, um, yeah, that was my first campaign. Um, I have DM'd exactly 1.05 campaigns, and so I can't really speak to whether that process actually worked, but we'll see. <laughs> well, it's better than most. Congrats. Cool. And I think with that, uh, we've gone through a good number of our uh, pre-prep topics. So uh, to shift into another gear uh, briefly, 
Uh, if you guys like, you can keep putting questions in the chat, and Kaya will continue to collate them for when we get to some Q&A uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but for now, we got a number of uh, uh, interesting memes submitted to us by a few people uh, this past week. So let's just go through a few of them. Uh, they're kind of awful, so by which I mean I love them and we love them, uh, but it's probably for the best that Zio is not here uh, because he would shut this entire project down if he were. Uh, but let's take a quick look. I've got some of them set up right here in well, order. Now that you mentioned the word meme. All right, so let's... Uh, I guess I'm not already streaming these on Discord, so the cast will be seeing them a bit delayed. Uh, let me see if I can actually get that started right now. I'm curious to know if I can get that working. So apologies for the brief technical difficulties. I hope that this doesn't uh, ruin our Twitch connection. There we go. Can you guys all see that all right? Yes. Uh, yes. yes. All right. Beautiful. So uh, let's go with the first one. This was a fun one. When we're talking about character introductions, uh, this actually predated uh, any of the introductions. This was a hot take from uh, one of the subreddit users, Strawberry, about one of our PCs, Amity. Uh, very particular vibes that they got from this one here. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious to know whether so this turned out to be so accurate. Much. Yeah, no, this is still oh, one of my so favorites. Good. So I feel good. like, <laughs> yeah, I was really I expecting her to be like a shit kicker, a mischievous little it's the firecracker. Smile. It just like it, it it screams dark things. Yeah, it screams like I'm gonna. I mean, I'm still not entirely convinced she didn't steal that pig. Um, she's gonna kill us all in our sleep in Death House. It's gonna be great. Yeah, she's got she's got layers. Um, but I feel like what we've been presented with so far feels very like that smile means something very different now that I have context. Linus, uh, do you have any uh, words in your own defense? Uh, I mean, I, I, okay. I mean, just see what I mean. Just see what happens. I mean, come on. There's no way that <laughs> why why would this come on? It's just an image. Yeah, I, I believe your us. denial. All right, next one. Uh, this one was also submitted by Strawberry. Uh, I'm probably not going to mention her name again, not because I want to discredit her, but because she submitted a lot of excellent content. Well, and she I'll is keep... meme lord. So. Yeah, so I'll say it whenever it isn't Strawberry. How about that? Uh, this yeah, one yeah. was about Kiva when her portrait was revealed. Um, nice little throwback <laughs> to the so late good. 2010, early 2000s. <laughs> The relevant yeah, end this, I, reference. Oh no! I wasn't. I wasn't <laughs> expecting to have a meme like the moment I revealed my character portrait, and I should never have doubted the meme lord of Ravenloft, but truly, truly made my day. Aesthetically, I think my favorite thing is that you didn't bother. Is that Strawberry didn't bother to flip the image, uh, which I, I, I again just aesthetically I'm pleased with. Oh, it's anime. great. I can give you guys a bit of background lore that Dragna knows. So originally, the scars on Kiva's face were going to be a Glasgow smile. And then I was like, no, everyone's going to call me a fucking edgelord joker. And I got called that anyway. So uh, fuck you guys, I guess. You can't Embrace. escape it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Embrace the Like, edge. you literally sent it to me. And I was like, wait, I, I feel like we're going to get a lot of Dark Knight memes. And you're like, yeah, maybe we'll change it a little bit. And you actually wound up changing it I'm to an reference right uh, that some people landed on in the chat yes yeah so it's for and um, forgive me if i'm pronouncing this incorrectly it's uh kintsugi scars uh and kintsugi pottery repair um is yeah was my inspiration for that so for all of y'all who got it nice nice uh aesthetic catching so the next one was uh definitely fun another it was another character reveal uh that uh some of us enjoyed uh I'll just pull it up on the screen right now because it is, as always, our wonderful and ineffable uh, Metreon. Because you're just, all disgusting thirst posters. I'm just glad he's he's uh, activating thirst. I'm I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that the the fans are wet. You know, um, that's all. I can always say. dripping. Dripping. I'm glad that Metreon makes you moist, and that's all I can say. PG thirteen. PG thirteen. Y'all are just like sinfully thirsty for one another. It's it's terrible. Even Zia was thirsting for you guys. 
I know. What? The song Wap what? by Cardi B and Megan Thee Stallion was written about Metreon, and I'll stand by that. Wait, who's Zena thirsting for? This is everyone. Yeah, he no, keeps saying everyone's sexy in chat. I. This is. Oh my uh, god. Hold on. We're going to need a few moments to absorb this information. I. What? All right. Well, Twy's brain is broken. We'll go to the next one. Uh, there was another comparison to uh, another uh, purplish skinned tiefling. Uh, I'm not sure how fair the comparisons are, but we'll show it briefly. Uh, no shade intended toward uh, the other uh, notable we, and much loved love, show that won't be named. Um, so far, you know, uh, Metreon's alive though, so. Uh, oh, jeez! Cool. <laughs> 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 oh my fucking god, Jack! Fuck you, Talisman! I'm okay. I'm okay. Someone please clip that. Someone please oh, clip god. that. Oh god. Well, to Jack. anyone who's been meaning to watch Critical Role season two but hasn't yet, sorry for the spoilers. Jack, you're not supposed to say that out loud because Dragna can fix that. Oh, that's true. Oh, it, 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 I'll, I'll be fine. Uh huh. So I assume this is some character from another D and D podcast. Yeah, yeah. I, I do not recognize this person. Oh my goodness, that's Molly from Critical Role. You're gonna get shamed in the chat. Nah, shame, we don't do that here. Shame. We don't, we, that we, we don't shame here. I mean, we live with shame, but we don't shame others. No, um, no, I'll, I'll live with that. We just I'm wallow fine. in our own uh, our own self cromulence. Um, but yeah, no, uh, I think this is I think this is cute. I uh, distinctly made him uh, warmer in complexion because I knew that the comparisons would be inevitable. Um, I think the pink suits him better than purple, honestly, like a lot better. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it, I there not to go too deep into backstory stuff, but there, uh, you know, uh, there are reasons for things, and exciting, uh, they will be explored. Um, and not to get too off topic, but I would just like to say that I'm very excited to see how Amity and Metreon uh, play together throughout this whole thing. All right, should be fun. We already got one of those interchanges with the uh, disguise kit going into Barovia, so should be a good time. All right, the next one was some uh, fun shade right after uh, the name for Erthrandir was revealed, even before the character portrait came out, I believe. Uh, courtesy of so Strawberry much. again. I love this so, so, so yes. much. This, I think this is the only meme that I've retweeted so far. <laughs> <laughs> so Look, it's not my fault that Cinderin's really fucking wordy. <laughs> But elves. Yeah, no, I <laughs> elves, man. But yeah, no, this is definitely one of my favorites. Cause like, yeah, no, I I knew that when I walked in that it was going to get mangled and shortened and compressed, and I was kind of excited for that. And I have not been disappointed. I have counted thirteen separate Erthrandir nicknames so far. Where do you stand nice. on the nickname war? I welcome them all. I will let the community decide. Uh, I'm a fan of Randy. Of you. I'm very much a fan of Randy. Randy is pretty nice. They're all nice. I mean, Randy makes him sound like he wears like a, a wife beater shirt and like Moses lawn on Saturday mornings. Bold of you to assume he doesn't. Oh, that's fair. Um, I mean, Randy to me sounds more like uh, like an exotic dancer. Um, I... It's the it's the eye at the end, you know. In before uh, Strawberry uh, puts Erthrandir's portrait on the, you know, you gotta eat Randy song. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> what? There's there's a song. Wow, I will, uh, a niche meme. That was I, great I will link time. it to wow. you privately um, later. Thank you. All right. Deep memory. <laughs> Deep memory. But yeah, no, I am I am very grateful for this one. So you said Cinderin. Does that mean that if I look up like a cinder in dictionary, I will divine meaning from your name? Yes, but it will not relate to the character involved. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Yep. So the next one, I think uh, this one came, was more relevant after the portraits came out because uh, it had big vibes to a specific character. But I think after the first episode, I think we can safely say that this probably applies to a good amount of the cast. 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's accurate. That's day to day life, man. That's, yeah, that's, that's just not me a mood. right now. That's not a mood, that's a lifestyle. <laughs> Unfortunately. But yeah, no, that's a. I, I have a sense that is probably everyone to some degree. Some more obvious than others. Marathon Deer and his death stare. Which Rune just did a fantastic job portraying. I told him he should look like a motherfucker, and by God, did he deliver. <laughs> I'm such a motherfucker. <laughs> oh, yeah, big. Uh, that, uh, mm -hmm. Kaya, you first. I will say that uh, Rune also had some select words for the exact shade of pink that Jack wanted. Uh, he tried really hard to edge it into purple, and then Jack said no. It's true. I was, I was very particular about the fuchsia that I wanted. Didn't it's we actually thing. send in, like, a color sample? I sent in two. <laughs> oh, <Same. laughs> Yeah, no, I, I wanted to make sure he got the hair right. I was very insistent about this. Meanwhile, speaking of Erthrandir and uh, class choices, uh, we have another one. Uh, still by Strawberry. We haven't gotten a non-Strawberry one yet, but maybe that'll change next week. But these are still top quality. Uh, that's the wrong one. Uh, here we go. Actually, oh no, he's hot was me. Oh yo, I'm sorry, I totally missed that. I wait, wait no. That, that was might have been me. That might have been me. I oh that was a strawberry yeah. Original. I'm so sorry, Twy. I'm sorry. It's yeah, fine. I have that labeled as strawberry. No, oh no, no, I'm 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 willing to accept the shame. So that was great. Wow, I'm terrible. I don't a... really understand this. Wait, meme. this is what he most wants. Yeah, because it's what he most wants the the dreams to be crushed. Hmm. I, mean, I feel like Randy's a dream crusher anyway, so... Oh, that's true. You never know. But yeah, no, I do love this one. And I will not comment on the subject matter, <laughs> for that would be spoilers. So another one that we've got that also relates to the portraits that uh, Twy did put together, I have it in my notes. So uh, <laughs> there we go. Good job, Serena. Thank you. I'm sorry! No, you're good, you're good. Uh, this one was a <laughs> favorite of it. mine. Oh my god, I love this one! <laughs> I, oh, this yeah, perfect. I, I was busily putting this together once we had three of five character reveals and I realized what direction the wind was blowing. Very, it's even very worse! Early on. Very <laughs> All early of you on. fuckers have dark vision! Together? Oh my god, it was so funny that we were like, wait a minute, do we all- are we all fucking, like, pointy-eared bastards? <laughs> very early on, Dragna and Zio were like, there is something that all of you guys have, um, something visually distinctive, and we we're all just throwing out random guesses. Um, and it turned out it was ears. I guess it was it all the ears. Called it. Yeah, I, I had a I had a feeling, but I was like, it, it was not my worst nightmare, which would have been an all elf party, which I never would have recovered from spiritually or mentally. Although, admittedly, that would have been rad. But it is still pointed ears. See, I was guessing that we all had huge fucking racks, so my was way off base. <laughs> Wishful I thinking, mean, I guess. Portraits don't really go go lower than our collarbones, so, you know. You don't know. Yeah. And I'm Metrion all bound had... up in leather armor, so, you know, it'll be a nice reveal this, the first time we do, like, a bathhouse session. Well, I... yeah, I mean, uh, some I of us might have really pendulous like Sarovic. <laughs> right next to Bluto. Do I really have to run a beach episode in Lake Zarevich no. now? Yes! 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 No. yes. yes. I will yes. still for a yes. beach episode. Please no. You have no, you have no <laughs> idea. Uh, all, everyone's in a bikini. Uh, we even all truffle? actually shared photos of our characters' swimsuits, like what they would be in our in our twice bitten like cast server, and I'm really excited to see to see what everyone thinks of Metreon's bathing suit in particular. I mean, I, now that we've now that we've actually played, I will say that seeing everyone's bathing suit choice makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> All right, so next one. Uh... This one is another Twy original, I believe, and this was my favorite meme out of all of them because it perfectly encapsulates uh, what Aerith and Deer showed in the first episode. It's oh my God, wonderful. So oh, yes, 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 yes. Just, <laughs> just the casual... <laughs> just a mood killer. He's just a mood killer. Like He's trying, all right? Worst wingman, just like... Is is he the one who was like Barry's kill three hours? 
Yes, yes, yes. 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 <laughs> that was great. What really killed me was like when they were on the road and like Lillison was like vaguely interested in what Erythrindir had to say about currency and he just launched into a manifesto for the next off-screen 45 minutes. Lillison was more than vaguely interested. She was actually very interested in the currency. Lillison's, Lillison's thirsty as fuck. That's all we gotta say. She's thirsty for knowledge. knowledge. Yeah, she's thirsty for knowledge. She's... It's not it's like the rest of us degenerates. Say. She's she's pure and, and kind this and good. This is true. This is true. Uh -huh, obviously. Uh, and when we hit 500 subscribers, we will upload those full 45 minutes. <laughs> and feed <laughs> do. And feed text. No, no. I just want no, to no, I am text. I am not <laughs> signing on to that. Well, it'll just be Jack feet picks. I'll do, yeah, I'll, Jack I'll, I'll take, I'll take your motherfuckers through my coin collection. I'm not I'm, afraid. I'm All right, like, we know where we're. Listen, and I are there for it. <laughs> okay, we know what we're doing for the next uh, after dark stream. Twice <laughs> coin collection. Let's do it. I let's not like realistically. But, Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the next one is a little more plot related. This was a fun moment uh, when. Uh, Metreon got a little bit spooked as to what was going on in Death House and a bit suspicious of the kids that had asked them to enter there. Uh, we got a few variations on this meme, but I think this one was my favorite. Just <laughs> goodbye, Thorn. <laughs> you know what? Uh, I didn't think that... Uh, I didn't think that I would be Thanos, but I, I'm not mad at it. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, oh man, what gets me is that like he pulled Rose in too after seeing yeah, what he did to Thorn. He just needed to check. <laughs> that is my favorite fucking thing. Well, oh, you, you, you need confirmation. So yeah, yeah, no, I like it. It's absolutely in character. It's just really funny. <laughs> just like okay, hmm. Well, this is not enough evidence. Time for trial two. Come on, Just Rose. It's the basis for any good science experiment. Exactly. Is he gonna, like, gonna take you know start taking kids from like random Barovian villages and like just like putting them through the door of Death House just to see what happens? Maybe it's not the kids. I'm, maybe it's the house. Yes. It's yeah. Dead kid bingo. Let's go. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Just throw them in there. Although I, I will say, in the very first D and D session I ran, a dear friend of mine who is in the chat right now ended it by stuffing a child in a flower sack and running away. So what? You're in good company. What? It's a long. Story. What was the context for this? I cannot fathom what possible reason. A sea hag, and some sort and mental compulsion nonsense. Long story. Uh, gotcha. She would rather kidnap the child than murder the child. That was either a lot of flour or it was a very big child. <laughs> it was a lot of flour and a fairly small child. Okay. All right, so next one. And also, I just posted in chat, uh, if you have any other memes to submit or if you have any artwork of Curse of Strahd or of the of Twice Bitten, it doesn't have to be Twice Bitten, uh, but if you do have it, uh, you can send that and any memes uh, and any other inquiries to our Gmail, uh, twicebittencos at gmail.com. And I think I got that right. Um, otherwise, we just got a, two more memes here. Uh, one of these is, I love this for the Ember Temple usually. It's very, very uh, accurate for the Ember Temple. But in this case, it was exceptionally relevant for Death House as well. As uh, Metreon will be very upset at Aerithrandir 4. <laughs> I'm upset yeah. at Erythrindir for this, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> I mean, honestly. You say uh, that this generally gets applied to Amber Temple, but like my party's Amber Temple adventure was, was five minutes in and out. <laughs> in fairness, that is probably the way to ex to handle the Amber Temple. Like you walk into what that has in store, and you want to walk out again. Ah, uh, yeah. yeah, Noah. Ah, oh, man. Oh, and a quick shout-out. This is uh, a meme by uh, Archer from the Curse of Strahd Discord. Apologies for not uh, citing the creator. Uh, thank you, Archer, for putting this one together. Whoop, whoop. All right. So I think that's uh, about all the memes I've got for now. Uh, we pro hope to have more next week, so feel free to send those in. Uh, I'll, we probably won't do After Dark every week. We're still kind of working out exactly what we're doing here. 
Uh, it might be a monthly thing. We're still talking about it. Don't want to overschedule, but uh, we'll try to do stuff when we can. Uh, in the meantime, uh, let's put these away and go back to the main setup. So, uh, Kaya, I believe we had some questions from the chat. We have a lot of questions. Um, our first question is from our resident, uh, lovely Canadian Dark Archer, asking everybody, how is your day? It's pretty chill. My mom found out that right. she's no longer ill with her vertigo nonsense, so that was very cheering. Awesome. Yeah. Pretty good for me. Oh, go on. Oh, uh, I was planning on spending most of the day uh, prepping uh, the village of Barovia, the Svalich Road, and Old Bone Grinder for uh, Twice Bitten. But instead, I wound up having uh, on and off uh, Discord meetings with people all day. So, you know, productivity. But I, was I feel like I got a lot done. I was not productive at all. I'm, I'm the same. Um, I'm lying to myself. Yeah, I'm still recovering from eating a whole pizza last night, so um, <laughs> that's where I'm at. I tried working out today, and, you know, it just wasn't there for me. Uh, Not on the guards. So I'll be having probably a late night tonight trying to catch up on all the work I wanted to do earlier. Yeah, I slept in until noon today when I was supposed to get up at 9 o'clock and uh, didn't really do anything except finish Castlevania. So I've got a late night ahead of me too, because I have to finish annotating our first episode for my notes. <laughs> oh, what are your takeaways from Castlevania? Oh my uh, God, I loved it. Sexy. It was so good. It was so good. Yeah, Jack, Jack unfortunately has to deal with all of my like thirst tweeting. Um, so, but it's great. It's great. I'm getting that blanket, by the way. I'm gonna make one, so. <laughs> Perfect. And who is the best character, in your opinion? I think I know the answer. Uh, it's For me, it's a hard tie between Carmilla and Alucard, and that's that's where I stand. Although I love Striga, my big-ass lesbian queen. Agreed. Striga's great. All right, Kai, what you got next? All right. Um, aside from the obvious from Linus, what is everybody's favorite animal? This is asked by our very own Strawberry. Raccoon. Raccoon for me, too. Falcon. Uh, cat for me, though. I, I took one of those animal quizzes once, and apparently I'm an owl, but I prefer cats. Ooh. What about you, Kai? Um, at the risk of being meme, uh, I have to say panda. And speaking of pandas, everybody who has not watched our Honey Heist show should go watch that. The bot is on YouTube. No, pandas are great. It's a good choice. They are obnoxious buggers, but I love them dearly. All right. Um, next question from Gadoff Blinsky, which I think that's the legend in uh, Discord. Um, what are the cast and DM's thoughts on post-mortem analysis, uh, aka just revealing backstory after a character dies? I'm fine with it. I mean, if the character isn't going to come back, you know, there's no reason not to. I think it's cool, but it's prudent to make sure that it kind of stays within its bounds. Like, if you're going to have that be a thing, then have it be long enough for it to be a relevant quest to help people come to terms and move on. But don't, like, keep one person oh, sh shadow over the rest of the yeah, game. Yeah, point. Yeah, very much, very much Molly syndrome. I think that happened in Critical Role, but um, I think it's fine. But I think for us, at least, there is there is plans up until level five. So if by then you guys haven't gotten all of the backstory, sure, I will tell you whatever you want to know. <laughs> Jokes on you! You're never unlocking Earthen Deer's favorite ice cream flavor. It's not God happening. <laughs> Um, for reasons of time, I'm going to be uh, skipping over some of the uh, sort of less uh, serious questions and going for this one from Mindless Idiots. 
For the PCs, all of you have in-depth knowledge of the campaign. How do you prevent yourself from subconsciously metagaming? Is it just staying dedicated to quote-unquote what would my character do and strict roleplay? Well, I've forgotten so much of the original module at this point that uh, I feel like it's actually pretty easy. Um, one part because I'm running something so vastly different that I've just had to make up a lot of stuff. Uh, and the other being so much of the line between rules as written and community content has been so blurred that um, all of that together has just kind of wiped my brain. So uh, in short, I feel pretty confident that I can I can play this without meta. Uh, and I and uh, if I don't mind, if you don't mind me going on a bit of a uh, not a rant, but uh, but a, a bit of a thread, I think that with this particular thing, um, because we know we are playing for an audience, there is that level of uh, entertainment to it. And I think that us having meta knowledge isn't a bad thing, um, so long as we don't abuse that. And the reason I think it's a good thing is because we're able to um, kind of in, in advance, not necessarily plan reactions, but we've processed the, the module from uh, kind of a, a writer's perspective or director's perspective. So now that we have that kind of in the back of our heads, we can use that to kind of determine what our characters would do in a more timely fashion. It's not like oh, I do this thing because it's impulsive and it's in the moment and oh no, but I don't feel confident in it. We, we have the, the time and opportunity to sort of sit, sort of sit with it um, and really l figure out how our characters would react to the things that happen. I will also say that um, running this rules as written, uh, it does sort of make it a completely different game uh, than what most of us have been running because, you know, we've been running it with a lot of the common community modifications and we will get surprised by things that we did not realize were in the module because everybody just sort of ignores them. And to piggyback off of that, like, kind of one thing that surprised me about that and kind of helped me realize that we are going to be able to see it from new eyes in respect was how much like just the like changing the art would kind of change my perspective like when we first walked into the Svalich woods i didn't recognize it as barovia because the art we'd chosen was so far from how i'd always pictured the woods to look that i could kind of authentically react to it because like huh yeah no this isn't my world i this is new this is scary i like this yeah, actually, big shout out to uh, James RPG Art on Patreon for uh, allowing us to use those animated backgrounds for Curse of Strahd. Uh, he's also done a lot of work for other campaigns like Lost Minds of Fandelver, uh, and I think a few others. He might have done Storm King's Thunder a bit as well, and some custom artwork. Uh, very, very good for uh, setting immersion for players, so I'm glad to hear that, uh, Twy, you took that away from it. Mm-hmm. And actually, just quickly regarding uh, metagaming, uh, just, you know, I'm not a player, but speaking as a DM who's uh, currently kind of reading through the module and annotating it heavily, uh, in the original module, aside from, like, a few traps, the opening of the Amber Temple, and most of the jump scares in Death House, there's not really that much hidden information. I mean, Kaya corrected me in Discord uh, saying that, you know, there are a lot of, you know, reasonably good decisions that, you know, or at least... Uh, perspectives that people who have played or run the module will have that people don't. For example, you know whether Velaki is a safe place or not is something that a uh, uh, an experienced DM or player will come into, uh, as opposed to a new player who will have only have heard about it from, say, Irina and Ismark. So that's obviously a different way they'll play it. But for something as diff as you know basic as you know the vampire spawn and bones quest, like there's not really any hidden information there. You know, Lucian gives the information you need. You can very easily learn about the threats that lie ahead. Um, and generally speaking, the module does a very good job, I think, of telegraphing threats uh, and assuming the players are willing to listen. That doesn't mean that, you know, a overly adventurous party won't wind up in a TPK because they were feeling a little too feisty. But I think that in general, the module doesn't conceal a lot of information, which means that metagaming, I think, is not as big of a threat as it would be in, say, a more dungeon-crawly sort of campaign. But that's my own opinion, so if anyone who disagrees is more than welcome to. 
I just think Jack is right in the sense that like, I don't remember a lot of the raw module just because I changed so much. So I'm completely relying on the fact that I'm like, I don't know where I am. I'm just sort of doing it how Kiva would do it and <laughs> sticking to that. If it happens to be, you know, some of my knowledge kicks in, like I message Dragna some big important spoiler that I'm not going to tell all of you guys, but I'm going to tease um, today, which was pretty an exciting revelation. But um, other than that, I'm sort of flying. I like flying blind. Speaking of flying blind, uh, next question comes from Knight of Pigs. I wonder who that might be in the Discord. Um, Dragna, what would you have done if the players had yeeted the Death House hooks? So the fun part about running Death House is that you don't get to do that. Uh, as uh, Metreon and Erythrendir and Amity discovered and picked up on quite quickly, uh, actually at the gates of Barovia. Uh, because if they don't go in Death House, the fog is going to corner them in there and it doesn't look like something friendly or entirely natural. So, I mean, it's not really representative of the campaign as a whole, but for the purposes of Death House, and this is, you know, an understandable criticism, uh, it is a very, very firm railroad. If they didn't go into Death House, that's fine, but the fog would have still kept creeping forward. The rest of Barovia would have swallowed up. If they lingered, they would have gotten turned around with exhaustion. Uh, and, you know, they would have seen that the house was the only safe place left to go. So, uh, in that respect, at least, it might not be uh, optimal or preferable for players and DMs who prefer a little more freedom in their hooks. But for the purposes of getting people from point A to point B, it's uh, blunt, but very effective. Okay, next question from Quintius Pern. What was your thought process when you made your characters? This is a bit of a weird one, but for Aerithrim Deer, I was really, really stumped. Because I, I had signed up to be part of this, I was really excited, but I just, nothing was coming to me. And then one day I was just out walking my dog, a certain song came on a playlist, and suddenly he was there. The funny thing is, like, he now, I could now safely tell y'all what that song was, because he's changed so much that he no longer really resembles that original idea, but yeah, that's pretty much the thing. And from a more meta perspective, he was also born from my love of elves and my interest in playing them in a different way than I typically see them portrayed. That's all I'm saying for now. Was the song Wax? It was. It was Wait, not. Pass. No, never mind. I'm not gonna finish that. <laughs> <laughs> it was not. I tried making a character that was sufficiently different from the first time I played uh, Curse of Strahd that it would be a different experience, while also still falling into the kind of character that like I enjoy playing as, uh, and so therefore we can determine that Amity is uh, the fourth best uh, kind of. PC I would enjoy playing as. Well. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, it's it's it, this is awesome. Uh, for me at least, because uh, I was, I mean, I was there when Dragna was just spitting hot takes, and I was just like cheerleader, like yes, yes, this is everything that needs to be said about this. Um, and so when I applied, it was obviously with nothing but enthusiasm. But then when it came time to like really figure it out. The thing that stumped me was uh you're not heroes you are not your class you may have an occupation or a, a lifestyle that is tied to your class but you are not ultimately your class um and that was really rough for me at first because you're kind of programmed i think uh in most ways to think of yourself as a system of stats and, and what class you are uh and then you kind of extrapolate what your character is from there um so that was tough and then i spent a few weeks kind of mulling it over and i think my sent i ended up like just having like a couple days where i was just like i need to figure this out um and so i ended up writing about how, i don't remember how many i sent dragon i think it's probably about 12 uh just like this google doc of like 12 different uh ideas and uh metreon wasn't even my first choice but uh but yeah i just kind of like tried to approach things keeping in mind that we weren't going to be heroes and that um the tone of the game was meant to be taking things a little bit more seriously and so i wanted to make sure that i picked something that 
would thrive not only with the tone but also react really nicely with it um because i think that's a big part of especially with horror um is the relationship between the protagonist and the antagonist and how they react to everything that they're going through oh that's really cool i've already i've said a lot about kiva tonight but i also think I kept coming back to like what would be the worst type of character to throw into Barovia and it's a barbarian who is afraid of raging and I think that's fucking hysterical. So on my part, Lillison is actually a character that existed before this campaign. Um, I had made her as a text roleplay character, um, basically out of whole cloth um, for just you know, exploring a setting that a friend of mine had previously run a campaign in. I tend to take um, characters that I love and sort of think about what would they be like if a certain event in their life had gone differently, um, you know, five or 10 or 15 years ago, what sort of person would that make them now? And uh, one of my characters, uh, name of Valsian, I have 14 different versions of her. if any, if anybody out there plays um, Cultist Simulator, the Volsian in there is me as well. Um, for Lillison specifically, uh, this is only the second Lillison, and the way in which I approach um, building a psychology for a character, uh, I'm actually going to be talking about a bit more uh, next Saturday, so look forward to that. Stay tuned. Ooh. <laughs> but only if you turn into Twice Bitten. Twice Bitten. Saturdays on Twitch. Ooh, I'm twitching right now. Oh my god, we cannot. We if we ever get asked to do, you know, one of those you're watching Disney Channel little ch- commercials, we cannot. <laughs> it's just do gonna that. be a dick. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I'm sure it's been done. Probably. Okay. Next question um, from Dang Dan. In your opinions, what is the biggest pitfall for new DMs running Curse of Strahd? I don't think it's a pitfall so much as a mismatch of expectations. A lot of new DMs, and I don't say this as a means of judging people or saying that they're doing it the wrong way, but more, a lot of people approach Curse of Strahd thinking that it's Skyrim with... uh, amnesia characteristics or i guess not amnesia i'm trying not to think i'm trying to think of you know a vampire horror game but i'm blanking on it right now um or say you know you know skyrim with until dawn characteristics if you've uh, played or watched that uh, particular game in that they assume that it's can be run like a normal D D campaign and uh, the players can be adventurers and heroes and murder hobos if they want and they can just kind of go with it and have a good time And, you know, often that can work out really well, but a lot of the time it can wind up in a lot of, you know, troublesome situations where the players wind up in a TPK because they misjudged the severity of a situation or they got cocky with Strahd or they were expecting to get cleanly through it and they got upset when they got into a mismatched level area Um, or, you know... I mean, literally, the I think it's like page four of uh, chapter one of the module that says uh, a lot of areas are overleveled. Do not feel like you have to push the characters away from these areas. Uh, the characters should feel free to flee or hide when outmatched. I took one look at that, and when I was going back over my annotations, and just said, ha, no, no one does that. No one ever does that in normal D&D. They're not doing it here, or at least they're not thinking to do it. And I don't say that as a means of, you know, shitting on DMs, but as a matter of Curse of Strahd is such a massive departure from normal D&D. A lot of people feel that they approach it as though, like I said, it's Skyrim with horror characteristics, but it's actually just a flat-out survival horror game as written. And so unless you make a lot of those community changes that make it a lot you know, less harsh, I feel it can be a very uh, cold shock to some players who might not be expecting it. This is also the first module that I ever DM'd, and I think one of the pitfalls for that I found, and this is gonna sound really sexual when I say it, but it's fine because it's after dark. Um, I got really overwhelmed by the size and just the overall scale of Barovia. Um, I was I was so I just didn't even know where to start prepping or you know how to think about preparing something that was this involved and had this much space for people to be in. Um, and so that took a lot of like for me 
really in-depth preparation because I wanted to make sure that I was understanding this very massive thing that was in front of me um, as much as possible as a first-time DM. Uh, <laughs> well, like, Curse of Strahd was my first module, and I feel like I can't comment on it because I've, I've messed with it so much. Um, but having read it, um, or at least most of it, um, uh, I feel like, like with most uh, any, like with most any other module, the, the commonality I think uh, is that you take on too much at once and you try to process everything at once. Um, I think especially with Curse of Strahd, um, because of its size and because of, of its complexity, um, it's best to process things incrementally. Um, you should still, you know, read of uh, you should still, you know, read as much of it as you can to try and get a, uh, an idea of what you're you're in for. But I think when you're kind of preparing it, uh, it's good to have a sense of restraint and just say, "Hey, I'm here now. Um, let me just kind of process this and then figure it out." Um, uh, I know that doesn't kind of jive with some DM styles because some people really embrace that sandbox kind of thing like that skyrim sort of thing that uh dragon was mentioning uh i typically don't just because uh uh i do try to cut it not necessarily real road but definitely I, I try to keep things a little bit tight with using hooks and things like that to kind of keep players on like a narrative track um but yeah i'd say just you know don't get too overwhelmed uh and uh also uh Understanding what kind of game you want is really important um, because the game the game itself as written is not for everybody, uh, whether it's the themes or the way that, you know, encounters are scaled. Like, it's not a traditionally heroic thing where you just kind of jump in, kick shit around, and you're the victors. Like, it's a much more uh, nuanced and complex place to tell a really interesting story. But if you don't... Uh, go in with the mindset that this is not the game that I was maybe raised with or that I'm, I'm being told that I should play, um, then it's it can feel that much more over, overwhelming. Yeah. And from kind of the other side of what Dragna was talking about, about how you can't really run it like Skyrim, I think what I'd say is that be careful about the temptation to think that this is a springboard to run a pure or very heavy RP campaign. Because, like, Curse of Strahd is definitely that. Like, it's RP heavy. But the thing that if you... a lot of I've seen a lot of people over the years, years, year and a half, that like get into it because they love vampires and they love gothic horror and they love these elaborate complex storylines and then you get to curse of strahd itself and a lot of the content is either fights or walking around nearly empty buildings that is it and so i i, th I guess my advice to that would be hey if you're running this expecting to be able to run a like thoroughly rp based adventure you're not going to get much out of the book you'll get like encounters and rooms but you are going to need to do a lot of modification if you want to make this what you want to see and that is probably more than you should do as your first time because that's a lot just a quick note, um, I am going to have to dip out because I am a player in the Post Wolves game. We are team two baths, um, but Serena will take over the questions. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, see you guys later. Bye, sweet Kaya. We love Bye. you. Love you, Kaya. Thank you, you for doing too. questions. Thank you. All right. Um, so, Linus, yeah, did you... Oh, so one specific like mistake I've made, I guess, if we're still talking about mistakes new DMs have made, um, is coming in without a clear idea of Strahd's uh, motivations. Like, I, I know that at some point Strahd sends you an invitation for dinner, um, and like at some point the book says he's like a, an active personality and frequently sees the party, yada yada, but um, I, it wasn't until like a few sessions ago that I actually sort of internalized 
what Strahd wants and why he is letting the heroes like survive so long, uh, and like how exactly he's trying to like toy with them and stuff. At least, at least in in my game, um, it can be different for you. And so then I realized that like, oh crap, Strahd like kidnapping this important NPC earlier is way out of line with what I now realize his motivations are. Oh no, I've written myself into a corner. What do I do? <laughs> this is the most interesting villain. I'm ruining this. Oh god, I. I did the same thing. I realized at level six, like, what is he doing? Why is he? What? 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 Is, what is, is he even? Why have you been running him like this? What does he want? It's I the worst. Strahd as a villain, but God, you. Uh, I'm gonna try to like make a guide to this or something. He's been oh yeah, I would read the hell out of that. Yeah. Linus no. guide. Linus guide. Linus guide. Yeah, we want it. But yeah, no, All I right, feel that, so absolutely. The next question comes from Bren of Tarth. Uh, what actions did you, the players, take to really get into the heads of your characters? Kind of a terrible answer, but I didn't. I wrote out his backstory. I figured out what kind of personality I wanted him to have and kind of just played that. I know some folks enjoy really getting into their characters' heads and reacting as them, but for me, it's always easier if I kind of have an idea of the kind of person I want them to be, come up with good reasons for them to be that person, and then go from there. Um, I think for Metreon, so I, my, my characters are, are usually good, dumb boys or uh, bad girls. Uh, so Metreon is very much a, diff a departure for the kind of character I play. Um, but I'm finding, I've at least found with the first session that uh, there are things with him that I kind of relate to in a lot of ways. So I just kind of draw upon my own, uh, some of my own both personal experience and secondhand experience from people like him that I know or like characters um, from different kind of media that I've consumed that feel very much like him and just kind of apply those to um, to his pathology. And so like like I think the Death House encounter with the armor is a pretty good example. Um, you know, someone like him would run. <laughs> you know, um, he's not a hero. He's not a good guy. Uh, and I think that, you know, I, would, I definitely wanted to like show people uh, the party in particular like, hey, first sign of danger he's not going to jump up and say i'm you know i'm the hero and you know it's because that's just not who he is yeah and it came off wonderfully he's one of the strongest personalities that came out of session one i think mm -hmm. at some point i will mention uh because I, I was pretty cloudy on him for a moment. Like I kind of had an idea of who I wanted, who we, who I wanted him to be, but the characteristics, the mannerisms weren't there for me. Um, but there's a specific movie that I watched that really crystallized things for me. I won't say what it is now because it will give a lot of, about who he is away. Uh, but when we're further down in the game, I will mention it and it, things will make sense. Nice. Linus, Twy, any thoughts? I gave my thoughts. Went, Linus, Linus, sorry. Uh, I don't know, it's a little similar to other people, but I guess one additional thing I do is I have some uh, lines that I help me get into my characters, both voice and personality, that I sort of, when you did uh, say, just to sort of get into the head. Um, also, I sort of picture myself in, in the character's body, and that helps me get into their personality somehow. I don't know. That's a, that's, that's good. I'm going to steal that. Yeah, I, um, it's sort of a joke to me, my, like, ridiculous character document, but for me, what's been the most helpful with Kiva is music, um, and getting into her head musically and, and finding songs that fit her has been really helpful. Um, before the first session, I listened to one of her two playlists, um, and that really focused me up, um, but I also have a, a whole page of quotes from literature and video games and movies that... Um, I refer to when I'm feeling a little confused about her as well. So, all right. Uh, next question is from, and I'm so sorry if I'm going to say this long, Quintus Fern. Um, how did you, how do you get players who are uncomfortable with acting to start role playing? So, 
So Ooh, that this is, is hard. That's one. a hard yeah. one <laughs> because I think you know. Yeah, Jack, you want to go first? No, no, no. Go ahead. Sure. So I think the question to this is kind of twofold because not all players are the same, and in fact, there are a lot of differences in how you approach this based on the kind of people your players are and the kind of game they want to play. Because first off, not all players want to play a game where they role play. Uh, some and role play doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. Some people are interested in a game where they just, you know, get together and roll dice and kill monsters and have beer and pretzels on Friday nights, and that's okay. That's valid. That's a very valid way to enjoy D and D. There's also the kind of people who, you know, enjoy playing archetypal characters. They, you know, enjoy being the paladin who bursts into the room and shouts Deus Vult, or the character who is very pious, or, you know, the wizard who makes, you know, all sorts of mystical jokes, or the sorcerer who makes bad puns. But, like, at the end of the day, they want to play out that specific archetype, and they're not interested in this very deep idea of roleplay. They're, they have more fun, you know, exploring these familiar characters than by, you know, acting out the skin of someone they don't already know. And that's okay, too, but for them... Roleplay to the DM might mean constructing a character backstory and exploring a character arc and character flaws, but to them that might just be mean playing someone that you find to be very flat and uninspired, uh, someone who's very tropey. And again, I don't mean to actually say that that character is uninspired, but that's a valid way to play the game that a lot of, you know, especially more character-driven DMs might not understand at first. And then finally you have, you know, actor... uh, players who are very interested in, you know, who is this character? I'll write 30 pages exploring what they ate for lunch today. Um, You know, I want to get into their skin and really understand how they role play. And, you know, it's more the second one and the third one who you really have to talk about when you you ask the question, how do I get them to role play? And in the second uh, second one, uh, it's probably a matter of not really knowing how to do uh, what what role playing involves or what it is. Uh, I've had players like this in one of my recent games where they really wanted to get uh, you know more involved in role playing and really exp- and really explore a character, but they weren't really sure how. And toward the end of the campaign, they felt a lot more comfortable with it. Um, but I think the first thing to address is that role play t- can doesn't necessarily mean just talking in character because a lot of players, especially new players, tend to. Uh, create characters that are extensions of themselves. They are vehicles through which they enter the world. And the player might very much want to roleplay, but the character that they've built is very much a reflection of themselves as a person, which means that they find it very difficult. Because branching out of that even a little bit creates this huge amount of cognitive dissonance where there's a person who's very similar to them, but they're changing something, which makes it a very uncanny valley kind of feeling. So I would talk with your players about that and discuss... Where is your comfort level in this? What does role playing mean to you? What do you want to get out of this? Uh, but also let them know your character does not have to be someone who you are. You can make them into someone who you don't already know and explore them and get to know them. And I think this kind of comes through in the idea of suboptimal decisions, where a lot of players will say, I want to role play, but they'll also say, you know, they'll also be very uncomfortable with making suboptimal decisions. Um, and I think this is the biggest barrier for a lot of new players because they don't want to feel like they're being punished while playing a game that they're enjoying. Uh, But in my opinion, the biggest leap to get over when you're trying to pass from, you know, just saying in character things to actually vigorously role playing a character is being willing to make that step to, um, you know, purposefully doing suboptimal things because it fits the character. And this is not a call out of, you know, min-maxers. You know, it's perfectly reasonable to make, you know, an optimizer character who's, you know, very tactically intelligent and, you know, does what's best for the for the group to try to keep everyone going strong. You don't have to, you know, be someone who intentionally fails to role play well. But it's a matter of finding out what the character is and doing what that is, regardless of how, you know, you, if you were there, would play the game. Those are not necessarily the same thing. So that was kind of a long-winded rant, and I hope it kind of answers the question. But I think that to kind of boil it down is a understand what kind of player you're 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 dealing with b understand what they want to get out of the game what they view role playing as and c try to encourage them to view a character as somewhat that they are acting as and not an extension of themselves as a vehicle for playing the game yeah Uh, that's that's yeah i was like oh Um, okay (laughs) that's great yeah uh i'll also say that taking a player who's never played D D before into curse of strahd like you don't necessarily know in advance and they don't know in advance whether they're going to be the type of person who enjoys role playing a lot 
which is why, like, personally, I ran Death House a year before I ran Curse of Strahd, and I ran a short homebrew adventure the summer after that. And um, part of the main reasons I did those uh, was that the people from those test campaigns who enjoyed role-playing and who I enjoyed playing with were the ones who I advertised my Curse of Strahd campaign to most excitedly. Ooh, that is a good strategy. Yeah. It, very much so. Uh, something that I do, just kind of like a, maybe I guess an, a, an addendum, uh, if you will, to what Dragna said, is once you find kind of all those things out and you ask those questions uh, to your players, um, if you have that player who is really into the idea of RP but doesn't maybe know how to approach it or isn't comfortable with it or whatever, um, the advice I usually give to DMs uh, is to think of it less as acting and more as a conversation in someone else's voice. Um, and, you know, it doesn't have to literally be someone else's voice, but it's the idea that if you treat things as a conversation, uh, you kind of you kind of break away some of the, um, I guess, some of the uh, apprehension that you might have if you approach things as like an acting job. If you think that I have to be a good actor to be a good role player, you don't have to be. Like, as long as you're kind of in in that headspace of your character and you're making decisions and replying and engaging in that conversation in the way that you believe that your character would, you're fine. You're doing the job. Um, you know, you don't need to be a, th a thespian to do this. Um, but if you want to be a good a good role player, you just have to think about having those conversations in the voice of who, uh, in the voice of who you're playing. Um, so yeah, I always say just you know just be. It's okay to be relaxed about it if you just kind of apply it. Like the golden rule to remember is that what would my character say, not what would I say. And you know sometimes there's some overlap. You know, and that's a it's a tough question sometimes for. Uh, players who aren't as um, seasoned in RP, uh, but you know you'll get there. Yeah, that is a very good point. And I do have a quick trick. This is mostly for folks who are evidently interested in story, but are having a hard time kind of articulating how they want to express their characters. Give them a house. Give them a room, give them some sort of thing that is explicitly theirs to influence. And you will find that when somebody has a bakery to run, or a room to decorate, or a city guard to help whip into shape, that suddenly they will know a lot more about their character than they thought they did. Because it's not about being able to, as Jack said, being able to, like thespian it is about kind of knowing who they are and acting as such and that person who might not be comfortable talking as their lady dwarf might be very comfortable figuring out that she apparently she really wants to whip this guard force into shape and also teach them how to do more humane policing or something like give them an inch of control and they will stretch it to the moon it's the best that's a really darn good idea I i'm gonna keep that in mind yeah, thank you. I wonder like how that comes across in a module like Dragon Heist that like actually gives people, you know, that kind of thing to control. It's an interesting uh, design decision. Yeah, I, I have not read it, but I am curious how they approached it. Just kind of like a, uh, uh, kind of going back to one of the earlier questions about uh, how you figure out characters for this module and then maybe in general, and kind of tying to what uh, Twice said. Um, when I make my questionnaires, I always ask kind of on the surface very mundane questions what is your character's favorite food what is their favorite music if you know if they existed in the real world you know what's their favorite movie things like that start to get the gears going so that when you are engaging with this player who maybe isn't great at rp um, or doesn't really have a really well-defined idea of who their character is or maybe they do and just just don't, don't know how to articulate it you have that to point to um, you say, oh, okay, well, they like heavy metal music. They like spicy food. You're a barbarian. So maybe they're just playing into that kind of uh, angry, you know, uh, feisty barbarian. But, oh, there's maybe, uh, maybe their favorite animal is a poodle. So maybe that's something that you can pull from. Uh, you know, maybe they also like really cuddly, fuzzy things, you know. And so you can kind of like start to develop the character from there. And then they can start to react in, uh, in situations that uh, feed off that, that play off of that. Awesome. That was a really awesome way to end this little uh, shindig that we've been doing. Really thoughtful answers. 
We um, like long-winded answers here at, uh, twice, at, at twice Bitten After Dark. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, so on that note, um, we are done with the audience questions tonight. Um, thank you guys so much for being so engaged and sticking with us for almost two hours as we sort of um, ramble about this crazy thing that we're doing. Um, very briefly, and then I'm going to get off my soapbox forever. Um, it is Kaya's birthday this week. Um, she is spending her Saturday, which is her actual birthday, um, with us in Barovia, which is so exciting. So we are going to be celebrating all week long um, with the hashtag Happy Bite Day Kaya on Twitter. Um, feel free to send little greetings. Uh, you can post them on Twitter, post them in the Discord server, um, email them to us, any memes and all that sort of stuff. Um, email, tweet, post in the server, um, just celebrating Kaya and how amazing she is um, at everything she does. And then that is the last thing I'm going to say. Dragna, over to you. Awesome. And yeah, Kaya's done a hell of a lot. She put together the music credits uh, for the stream. She reached out along with Serena to a lot of the composers and a lot of the uh, game companies to get uh, music permissions. Uh, she put together an incredible log of the first episode and has just been uh, a very much a rock of the production so far. So huge credit to her, and we're going to look forward to uh, celebrating our most secretive PC uh, this coming week. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us uh, tonight. As mentioned earlier, uh, we're not sure how much of a regular thing this After Dark gig is going to be. We might do it, you know, uh, once a month. We might do it somewhat more frequently. Uh, we'll probably do another one after we finish Death House, uh, depending on how many sessions that takes. Uh, you, should, you can expect it to still be, you know, some discussion of campaign events, some uh, analysis of Curse of Strahd module design and general DMing ideas, tips and tricks. Uh, but hopefully you guys have enjoyed the time here. We've loved having you and we're very much looking forward to seeing you this coming Saturday. Um, if you haven't uh, seen it in full yet, the first episode of Twice Bitten is available on our YouTube channel. Um, and Serena, I believe we officially have a custom URL for that, right? We do. It is um, youtube.com backslash C backslash R Curse of Strahd, I believe. So that is our official professional YouTube channel name now. Very much so. And we also uh, are pretty going to be pretty active continuing on Twitter. Uh, there's a bunch of good content on there. Uh, I definitely recommend checking out to stay in touch and stay in the loop. Uh, we are at twice bitten COS. That's twice bitten COS on Twitter. Um, as well as mm -hmm. Twy? I uh, just saw someone asking in the chat for time. That will be 1 p.m. this Saturday. For yes, our next the, round. the main Twice Bitten stream uh, and episode two will be every week at Saturday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, so hopefully you all can join us this coming week. Uh, yes, it is 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. So uh, if you'd all like to check out YouTube and Twitter, we would love to see you guys there. Uh, you can also sign up for the Twice Bitten role in the Curse of Straw Discord. And otherwise, we look forward to chatting with you guys and continuing to uh, have you join us on this adventure. It's uh, been a hell of a fun story so far, and we're very much looking forward to seeing what comes next. So thank you all. Uh, we love you, and we will see you this Saturday. Throw a tea in the trash for Truffle. Tea's for Truffle, baby. Woohoo!